Alright, hi everyone. I hope you guys are having a great day. So, my name is Kimberly Brown and I'm going to be your instructor for this semester. So, just a little bit of information about me to introduce myself. I have a master's degree in clinical psychology from Mississippi State. So, for those of you who might not know, clinical psychology focuses on the assessment, diagnosis, and treatment of psychological disorders. So I thought that I would be what you think of when you think of a therapist, right? Lay on a couch, talk about your mother, that kind of thing. That's a joke, by the way. Um, however, when I was in grad school, my last year in grad school, they were looking for someone to teach a section of general psychology. And I thought that would be fun, and I could do that for a semester and then get back to my clinical work. Um, so I was really excited when they chose me for that. Up until the night before classes started when I realized that I was terrified of public speaking. Which, granted, I should have realized beforehand, but I was so excited about sharing information with, you know, the young minds. So I got very little sleep that night, and I got up and consumed way too much caffeine, and I went in and taught what was probably a horrible lecture, just to be honest. And it kind of went on like that for the first couple of weeks. I was really nervous. But exposure therapy works. The longer you do something, the easier it becomes. And I actually had a point, and I can remember this point, where I realized that I was enjoying myself. And I didn't want to stop teaching. So that point was oh, five and a half-ish years ago. And I have not stopped teaching yet. So uh, I obviously teach at MUW, but I also teach at MSU as well in the psychology department there. So this semester I'm teaching four classes in person at MSU and then teaching the two online classes at MUW. Um, other things to tell you guys about myself, I am married. My husband Michael and I have been married for 10 years. We just celebrated our uh, 10 year anniversary and we have three fantastic kids. Um, I have my two big kids. Um, my son's name is Christian, my daughter's name is Maddie, and then we also have a little one, a little uh, baby, Brandon. So you'll probably hear me uh, use examples from them since this is uh, human growth and development. You'll hear quite a bit about my kids. Um, so I tell you, my, about you about my kids for that reason, but then also any mom wants to talk about her kids. But I think that each person's unique experiences also impact the way that they approach topics in every class that they teach. So I uh, wanted to just warn you guys, you'll probably hear a lot about my adorable kids. Um, other things to tell you guys about myself, I am a Christian, and that's not something that will probably come up again in lecture, but it's an important part of who I am, so I wanted to share that with you by means of introduction. And the other thing that I usually tell my students is that I have OCD, and I take Zoloft, which seems like strange information to share uh, with my students, and maybe even more strange to share with all of YouTube, but... The reason I share that information is I have a theory that if mental health professionals are ashamed of their own mental health issues, then we're hypocrites and we are contributing to the stigma. Also, I'm a lot more fun as an instructor and just in general when I've had my Zoloft. So I do it for you guys, right? So I just want to let you guys know. No, seriously though, I can't tell my students that it's okay to seek help. I can't encourage you to be a psychologist. If I also feel like mental health is a shameful thing. So there you go. Throw that out there. I've struggled. I'm human. Um, that's probably enough about me for now. As you can tell, I'm a relatively open book. You'll probably hear other things about me throughout the lecture videos. I do want to get to know you guys. That can be a little bit difficult in an online class because we don't have that face-to-face -face time. But feel free to email me. And then also we will be having some short writing assignments you'll hear about in a second when I talk about the syllabus. So hopefully I'll get to know you guys a little bit through that as well. So a couple other things I want to talk about before we turn towards the syllabus. So first of all, my teaching style. As far as teaching goes, there are a couple of things that are especially important to me. And one of those things is to be interactive and the other is to be fair. So it is challenging to be interactive in an online class, but I don't want to just lecture information at you. I want to include um, examples and uh, additional information beyond what's just in your textbook, and I want to be available for you if you have questions or things to contact me. So one way I try to be interactive in online classes would be through these lecture videos. Um, as far as being fair goes, what I mean by that is that I want all my students to have the same opportunities to be successful. So what that means is that I'm going to provide what you need in order to succeed, 
for all the students. So lecture videos and slides and reviews and all of that. But what that also means is that I'm not going to make a special exception for a particular student unless you have some kind of accommodation plan. That's not what I'm talking about here. But for example, every semester there'll be a student who is really close to that next letter grade and they'll email me asking me to just give them points or to create something extra credit that's just for them and not for other students. And I'm telling you now on the first day of class that I would do that. It would not be fair to my other students for me to make grade exceptions for one student and not for others. So if you have a question about your grades, you need to come and talk to me early rather than waiting until the very end. As soon as you have a grade concern, please feel free to let me know. The other thing I want to share with you guys is the secret of success in college. So I have been around college for quite some time as a college student, grad student, uh, as a professor. And I have discovered that truly the success uh, of really any endeavor, but I'm gonna say college in particular, depends on personal responsibility. So if you have a student who made an A and a student that made an F, what is the difference between those students? In my class, I can't speak for every other class, but in my class, you have the same lecture videos, you have the same material, you have the same textbook, you have the same exams. The only thing that's different between the two is the effort that you put into it. So this is a relationship. As your instructor, you have expectations of me. You expect me to answer your emails and to communicate that information in a way that's effective and to grade fairly, right? I have expectations of you. I expect you to watch these lecture videos, take notes, study, email me with questions, turn in assignments on time. So I will be personally responsible for my part, you be personally responsible for your part, and then chances are you'll be pretty happy with the way the course goes. Okay? So let me know if you have any questions about any of that. My plan for today is to switch gears and talk about the syllabus for a bit, and then we're also going to have just a tiny bit of lecture for today. So let's go ahead and talk about the syllabus. All right, so I have the syllabus pulled up here. You can find this on Canvas. I do want to just say that if you have any difficulty accessing any of the materials on Canvas, please let me know. I tried to set up everything in a way that was user friendly, but if you have any questions or problems with that, uh, let me know. Also, you should be able to turn on closed captions on the YouTube videos. Uh, if you have any issues with that, let me know as well. So, as I've said, my name is Kimberly Brown. Um, I do not have specific office hours for a couple of reasons, um, mainly because I don't live in Columbus. Although I am able to come to Columbus if I need to, I do have an office where I could meet you there, be happy to set that time up with you, but also because in an online class, um, there are usually issues that can be resolved through email, questions that you have. So if you would like to meet with me or we could potentially Skype or that kind of thing, then you just need to contact me and let me know. We can set that up. Email is a good way to get in touch with me. I do check my email frequently. You'll see that listed here. So as far as my goals for the class, we are going to try to cover a lot of ground in a relatively short period of time. You'll see this when we look at the schedule coming up. So we're going to be talking about some stuff before we get into development, just theories, that kind of thing. And then we're going to start at conception and we're going to go all the way through the lifespan to death. So that's a ton of material, but what I want you to know is for each stage of life, I want you to have some information about the physical, cognitive, and social development that takes place during that stage and how we can help others develop well and help ourselves develop well in whatever stage a person is in. So I also want you to be able to think critically about ways to encourage appropriate development. So we'll be talking about parenting, we'll be talking about interacting with kids, teaching kids to read, that kind of thing. And then also whenever we're talking about the entire lifespan, there's going to be a plethora of ethical issues that will come up that we can talk about as well. So. It's a fun class to teach. As far as the required materials, you'll see the textbook listed here. So I do not use the MindTap software. I've never used that before. What you need for this class is access to a textbook. And then all the assignments are going to be completed through Canvas. We're going to talk about the assignments in a second, but all you need is access to the textbook. You can find a used copy online, or you can get a copy of the book, that's fine. Also, I have been told that, um, or I was told, and this has been a year ago, I'm assuming it's the same now, but you want to double check 
that the MindTap uh, software system also comes with access to the uh, textbook. So I would encourage you to shop around and find the cheapest, best option for yourself. But you do not need to complete any assignments for me in MindTap. We're going to be doing everything assignment-wise in Canvas. Okay, let me know if you have questions about that. This is an online class, so I am expecting students to have access to the internet to watch these videos, but then also, as I said, all of our assignments are going to be completed in Canvas. So, the way the class is going to be set up is that I'm going to be doing lecture videos. You're already getting a taste for that now. I will post one lecture video per week, so I'll be expecting you to watch this lecture video, or the lecture video for each week, and take notes. I do have slides that are posted on the Canvas website, you can use those, but I encourage you to make additional notes as well, examples and things that I say um, would also be helpful to make note of. And then I also encourage you to email me with any questions that you have after you have watched the lecture videos. So the lecture videos are going to be the primary way that I'm going to communicate the information from the class to you. And then as far as you communicating to me that you understand the material, there are going to be two main components to your grade. The first of these is going to be activities. So not every week, but almost every week, we will have an activity. So an activity is a short writing assignment. It, I require students to have at least 200 words in their response. And you can do more than 200 words, that's fine, but make sure you have at least 200 words. I have found that an easy way to do that would be to type up your response ahead of time in Microsoft Word and then you can copy and paste that into Canvas because Microsoft Word gives you a word count. I'm not sure that Canvas does. So it could be really helpful for you to use Microsoft Word, but some way keep track of your word count. You need to have at least 200 words. So I will discuss each week's activity in the lecture video. So at some point in the lecture video, I will stop and say, okay, this is what we're talking about this week. I want you to ask uh, these questions to yourself. I want you to give me your opinion on this topic. So usually the activities are straightforward. The really the only way that students don't get points for activities is if they are too short or if they are late, not turned in, that kind of thing. As long as you follow the instructions, you should be able to get these points. They're primarily based on your experiences, your opinions, incorporating some information from the lecture videos as well. So what you'll see is that most weeks we'll have the video posted on Monday and the activity opens on Monday. And then the activity is going to close at 5 p.m. the following Friday. So you'll see that when we get to the schedule. Each activity is worth 10 points. I'm going to keep your top 10 activities. So that means you can get up to 100 points from activities. There will be 12 activity, activities total, which means that you do get two drop grades for activities. So sometimes students forget to do an activity or they don't get full credit for an activity and you can use a drop grade there. But also, sometimes students like to save their drop grades, work hard on activities 1 through 10, and then give themselves some breathing room at the end of the semester and not have to complete the last two activities. So just something to keep in mind there. The other major component of your grade will be exams. So in this class, there are five exams total, and each one is going to be worth 100 points, and I'm going to be automatically dropping your lowest exam grade. So what this means is that I will be keeping your four highest exams. If you miss an, an exam, or if you don't do well on an exam, you can just drop that one and not worry about it. Or you can take the first four exams and then save your drop grade for the final exam. That's usually what students like to do. Or you can take all five exams and I'll just drop whichever one is the lowest. But I'm gonna, at the end of the semester, I'm gonna keep your top four exam grades, okay? Now, as I said, five exams total, keep your top four exam grades. Exams one through four are multiple choice, true, false, and matching. Exam five is a final exam that's a take-home essay format. So we have four sections to the class. After each section, you'll have an exam. After the first section, exam one, second section, exam two, third section, exam three, fourth section, exam four, and then there'll be a final exam that will ask, I think it's 10, 10-ish essay questions, and it will be open for several days, and you can go in, work on it, save it, come back to it. As long as you submit it by the deadline, that's fine. If you do complete the final exam, the deadline for that is going to be 5 p.m. on April 30th, so just bear that in mind. And, of course, you'll get reminders of this along the way. 
but usually students like to work hard on exams one through four, the multiple choice true false matching exams, and then not have to complete the essay exam. Now exam four is a little bit different from exams one through three in that it is going to be our proctored exam. So we'll talk more about that in a second when we talk about the attendance policy. Uh, exam four is still multiple choice true false and matching but you have to make an appointment to take it with the proctor and that means you will not be allowed to use your notes for exam four. Okay. All right so at the end of the semester to calculate your grade I'm going to add up your top 10 activity points for up to 100 points. I'm going to add up your top four exam grades for up to 400 points, which means you can get a maximum of 500 points in the class. So the grades in my class are going to be based off of a point system. So if you want an A in my class, you need 450 points. 449.5, I will round up. 449.25, you're out of luck. Okay, so personal responsibility, got to get your points. Uh, 400 to 449 is a B, and so on and so forth. Now, <clears throat> this is the way I calculate grades. And if you have questions about this, feel free to let me know. In previous semesters, students have requested that I not hide the grade column in Canvas. Up until this semester, I've always hidden the grade column in Canvas because I don't use that grade column to calculate grades. Okay, I use this system with points. However, students continue to request that I keep that visible. And so this semester, I'm going to try keeping that visible. But what I want you to know is that that's just a... An average, a general average that does not necessarily reflect your accurate grade. Like for example, if you got a zero on an extra credit assignment, Canvas will drop your grade based on that. But your grade, as far as I'm concerned, doesn't drop based on that. So I am warning you that the percentages that you see in Canvas are not 100% accurate. They should be close-ish, but they're not 100% accurate because of things like extra credit or because of drop grades that need to be taken into account at the end of the semester, that kind of thing. So I'm going to try leaving that grade column visible, but let me know if you have any questions about that. I will be adding up your top 10 activities and your top four exams and any extra credit that you have to get a points total at the end of the semester. So as far as extra credit is concerned, you need to remember that you can only get a maximum of 15 extra credit points. So if you earn points above 15, those will not count towards your final grade. Now as far as ways to get extra credit, um, I have practice exams, so when the regular exams are released, I also release a practice exam. Each one of these is worth two points total, so that's not a lot at any one practice exam, but that's eight points um, because you have practice exams for exams one through four. That's eight points throughout the semester. So I do this for extra credit, but I also do this to try to help students prepare for the regular exams. So the practice exams are helpful. You take those first. I'd recommend taking those first. You don't have to. But take that before you take the regular exam, and then you can also see the answers for the questions after you've taken it, um, and then email me if you have any questions about that. But practice exams are optional. You don't have to do that, but can be helpful for a little bit of extra credit. Also, as I said, there's going to be a proctored exam, exam four. So students have the opportunity to submit the date, time, and location of your proctored exam appointment for extra credit. Um, we'll talk more about the proctored exam in a second, but you can go in to Canvas and then click on Smarter Proctoring, the Smarter Proctoring tab, uh, once you go into the class and set up the appointment there. I should have Canvas already set up for you, that you could do this now. And the extra credit assignment is open now. So if you wanted to go in today and set up, assuming that they'll let you schedule it that far in advance, I, I'm thinking they would. Um, the point is, you can schedule that pretty early and go ahead and get those points. Um, but this this assignment will close. The extra credit assignment closes, I believe, the Friday before the proctored exam opens, which might be April 17th, something like that, I believe. So you have plenty of time to complete that, ex that assignment, but if you do want to do that, you need to make sure you do that before it closes. Also, there will be at least one, maybe two, other additional extra credit opportunities that I will uh, have in the class. All right, as far as the attendance policy goes, having an attendance policy for an online class can be a little bit tricky. Um, the way that I'm communicating information to you is through the lecture videos, so I do expect you to watch each lecture video in its entirety and let me know if you have any questions. NUW does have a policy that students need to be in attendance for class. And so what this means for an online class is that I am measuring attendance through the activities. 
So you need to complete at least 50% of the activities, at least six of the activities on time in order to receive credit for this class. So make sure that you're turning in those activities. I recommend that you do more than six, but make sure that you do at least six activities. Okay. Let me know if you have questions. Uh, also, we have to authenticate identity in this class, verify identity. So th there needs to be a two-step system here, and one step is that you have your own unique password that you use, and that is one way that you can verify identity, but it's not enough. We need an additional uh, step to do that. And the way that we're going to be doing that in this class is through that proctored exam. So as I said, when you go to the Canvas page for the class, if you look on the tabs, on the leftish side of the screen um, like where you have modules and that kind of thing. Down towards the bottom you should see Smarter Proctor and you can go in there and you can make an appointment to take this test with a proctor. So if you're taking it at MUW, usually that's really easy. If you are not in the area, then you may be able to find a proctor through Smarter Proctoring. If not, contact me. Sometimes students have made arrangements to take this test with a proctoring system at like a community college that's close to where they live. Um, I'm okay with that. You make an appointment with the proctor and you send me the proctor's official work email and then I can email the password and instructions to that proctor. It's not that difficult, but you need to make arrangements with me if you're going to do this another way instead of smarter proctoring. Okay. So this is the way that you verify your identity. You have to take exam four with a proctor, so please let me know as soon as possible. I put a deadline down here, but this is kind of a soft deadline just to encourage you. But please let me know as soon as possible, at least by February 3rd, uh, if you think there might be a problem with you taking the proctored exam so we can get that figured out as soon as possible. You will not receive credit for the class if you don't verify your identity, so a very important step there. As far as uh, makeup activities and exams, so activities are open for five days at a time. So um, students are not going to be given makeup activities, especially because there are two drop grades for activities. So if you need, you can always use a drop grade, um, unless there's some kind of very extraordinary circumstance, in which case I will work with you. Same kind of thing with exams, um, only in extreme circumstances, because exams are open for several days, usually a week. Um, the proctored exam is a little bit different. It's like five days, but there are several days that you can take the exams. Um, but if there is an extraordinary event that allows for makeup exam, I do reserve the right to have the makeup exam be an essay exam. All right. As I said, make sure that you verify your identity. Be prepared to bring some uh, picture ID uh, when you go to take your proctored exam. As far as communication, email is the best way to get in touch with me, so please feel free to do that. You can email me just to introduce yourself if you would like to. That's perfectly fine. Uh, please remember that I do have quite a few other responsibilities, um, and I will respond to your email as soon as I can. I will also be sending out emails. I like to send out uh, usually weekly announcements of um, what's going on, which activities do, that kind of thing. So please check your email. I will also be making announcements during the lecture videos. So make sure that you're watching those videos and keeping track of that. As far as academic integrity goes, there's a lot that I could say here. You see the MEW academic integrity policy. Um, if you have a question about whether or not something is academic dishonesty, the best thing you can do is to have an open, honest conversation with your instructor before you turn in the assignment. So if you're just not sure, did I cite this correctly? Is this appropriate? Please always ask before you turn it in, right? Always ask. Now, in this class, a couple of ways that this could play out. One thing is that you are not allowed to use other internet sources or other people for your uh, exams. Now, I know this is an online class, and if you use the textbook and the notes that are posted, I'm okay with that. I'm aware of that. But I do not want you to use other individuals, having other people taking the test for you, and I do not want you to use other sources like the internet, Google. Google doesn't know what I know, right? Okay, maybe not. So the idea here is that you need to complete your own work. Also, the writing assignments. So we have weekly activities, and then some of you will complete the essay final exam. Please do not plagiarize, okay? Please. Um, so if you use a source, you need to cite it appropriately. 
be aware that if you turn in an activity that is primarily another source, that's plagiarism, even if it's not uh, something that you failed to cite. If your entire response came from someone else, then you didn't do any of the work, right? So make sure that you're writing in your own words. The activities, the final exam, do not require any sources outside of the material that I present to you in the lecture videos. But if you do use other sources, please cite them appropriately. Also, <clears throat> please do not plagiarize your textbook, okay? So sometimes students will turn in final exam questions uh, for me that they have just typed straight out of their textbook. Please don't do that. I'm asking you to take this information and to answer it in your own words, okay? If you have any questions about that, please let me know. Accommodations. If any of you need additional help, please feel free to let me know. Um, the way that this works is that you should contact the Student Success Center on campus. And there's information here. There's the phone number and the email address for those folks. And they will give you an accommodation plan. And then that accommodation plan can be sent to me. So I am happy to provide any help that you need. Um, but we do need to have this accommodation plan in place. As I said at the beginning of the video, if there's any kind of difficulty that you have accessing any of the material in the class, please feel free to let me know. Uh, MEW has a Title IX policy that is intended to protect individuals from uh, discrimination based on sex uh, and sexual violence. So if something like that were to happen to you, you can contact me. Um, I would encourage you to contact Title IX folks. So the phone number and the email address is listed here and the location where you can find uh, this individual. So I should say that as an instructor in general and as an instructor for the psychology department in particular, students sometimes come to me with their personal issues and concerns. And I am here for that. But you should also know that because of my position as the instructor, it is part of my job that I am a mandatory reporter. What that means is that if you were to come to me with concerns about hurting yourself or hurting someone else or abuse of a minor or a vulnerable adult, then I have to report that. That's not the same necessarily as reporting it to the police so much as reporting it to the Title IX folks uh, reporting that to my department head, that kind of thing, to make sure that everyone is safe and that everyone has the help that they need. So uh, I want you to feel like we have a, a good relationship. I don't want you to feel betrayed by me, and so I want to let you know from the beginning that that's something that I have to do as part of my job. So I have a hyperlink here that will take you to the academic calendar. I encourage you to keep an eye on that uh, for deadlines, especially things to do with financial aid, that kind of thing. I do reserve the right to adjust the syllabus as needed, although I don't anticipate having to do that. All right, so when we look at the schedule here, you'll see that we're going to start off with some information about developmental theories. We will do just a little bit of this today, a brief lecture after uh, we get done talking about the syllabus. And then next week, we'll finish up that information about developmental theories, and then we'll start prenatal development. And then after that, you're going to see a pretty consistent theme for a while where we have physical development, cognitive development, social development, right? And so you're going to see physical, cognitive, social development. This is going to be repeated over and over again. So we're going to talk about infancy, middle childhood, adolescence, young adults, work, middle adulthood, later life. I mean, I really don't like being told in what order to cover topics. But when it comes to human growth and development, there's really no way to alter this order. And also, it's not a very sunny way to end the class, right? We're gonna wrap up the class talking about dying and bereavement, right? Well, I really don't know how to put dying and bereavement anywhere else but at the end. So that's just the natural uh, progression of things. So what you'll see as far as weekly schedules is that this week we do not have an activity. So you just need to get the textbook, uh, listen to this lecture video, email me with questions. Next week we're going to start having our activities. So the lecture video will be posted on Monday morning and then we will have the activity due by Friday at 5 p.m. and that's going to be repeated over and over again. You'll see when exams open that they're going to open on a Monday at noon, 12 p.m. and they're going to close at noon or 12 p.m. on the next Monday. So on January 27th, I'll post this last lecture video for the first section and then you'll have a week to watch that video, study, 
do your activity, do the practice exam for extra credit if you would like, and then take the regular exam. Now, every semester, I have some students who get confused on this, who think that 12 p.m. is midnight, but 12 p.m. is noon. So I usually post the videos earlier in the morning on Monday, and I want to give you time to watch that video before the exam opens. So the exam opens at noon and closes at noon a week later. Opens at noon on a Monday, closes at noon on a Monday. Please do not wait until February 3rd at midnight and go in and try to take the test. It's going to be closed. Okay. If you want to take it late at night, you're going to need to do it one of the other days that it's open. And let me know if you have any questions about that. The only one that's different really is the exam for the proctored exam. So this has to be taken with a proctor, so I set it up during business hours. So it's going to open at 8 a.m. on April 20th, and it's going to close at 5 p.m. on April 24th. So it's going to open on a Monday morning, it's going to close at 5 p.m. on Friday. So that one's a little bit different. And then the take-home final exam for students who complete it will be due by April 30th at 5 p.m. I will post your grade in the class going into the final exam so you'll know whether you want to complete it or use it as your drop grade. Okay? All right. I think that's everything I have to say about the syllabus. Please let me know if you have any questions. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and switch gears and have just a little bit of lecture for today. All right. So as I said, I have the slides pulled up here for you. Um, this set of slides you can find under modules. We're going to be going through these in the order that they are posted. And today we're going to be just doing a small introduction to the class. So first of all, defining human development. Human development, or the study of how people grow and change over time, is a multidisciplinary science. So there are lots of different areas that we're going to be talking about. Of course, psychology is going to come up. It's going to be heavily influential. But we'll also be talking about biological changes that uh, refer more to perhaps medical issues, that kind of thing. So there's going to be lots of different fields that are incorporated into the study of development. We're going to study how and why people change and how they remain the same over time. So I'm sure that you're aware as you get older there are certain aspects of who you are that change with experience as well as change uh, with uh, physical development, biological development. We know that uh, once that frontal lobe of our brain develops, it changes the way we see things, the way we make decisions. But also there are certain components of who we are that stay at least somewhat stable. So we'll talk about personality issues and that your personality, although it is flexible, uh, for the most part those personality traits do remain relatively the same. So we'll talk about how people are both unique and similar to each other. So development is something that in a lot of ways is the same for everyone. So uh, we're going to be rolling over typically, rolling over before we crawl, and crawling before we walk, and walking before we run, and, and these things. So there are some uh, universal processes, but then there are also some things that are different for each child, different for each person, and so uh, those issues are always very interesting when we get to those. So this is kind of a general overview here, but primarily we're going to be talking about development in three different categories. And you'll see this when you look at the slides. So if you look ahead, there'll be slides about physical development, cognitive development, social development. Of course, it's difficult to separate these out as if they're entirely unique from each other. Of course, uh, your development in one area impacts your development in other areas. But physical development is referring to your health. It's referring to changes in size, proportions, appearance. So as we're physically growing, our bodies are changing. We'll also talk in uh, our lectures about physical development, about skills, things like handwriting and, and jumping and, and different like gross and fine motor skills that develop over time uh, as we age as well. And then cognitive development or changes in cognition. When you hear cognitive, you should think about a mental process. And usually when we think about cognitive uh, or cognition, we think about a person's thoughts. And that would be one thing that would fall in this category. So studying the way that people think and how that changes as they develop. We will be talking about intelligence. We'll talk about um, the way that children think, um, some cognitive deficits early on, uh, that as we get older, we're able to think more logically, that kind of thing. And then we will also talk about social development. So we'll be talking about how uh, parenting that we receive, people that we spend time around, uh, the media, culture at large uh, impacts us a great deal. We'll be talking about how uh, we communicate our emotions, how we model uh, what other people do. 
um, how we think about ourselves and others, how uh, relationship skills develop or don't develop. So we'll talk about certain uh, disorders along the way as well. Uh, moral reasoning will come up. Why do we have morals? Where do our morals come from? How do they impact our behavior? So as we go through the different time periods, we're talking about physical, cognitive, and social development for each. Now, when I talk about different uh, periods of development, there are many, and this slide does not cover all of them. You'll notice that this slide kind of stops at emerging adulthood. Um, don't let that fool you, though. We are going to go all the way through the lifespan. The reason why this slide stops around emerging adulthood is that after that point, we don't necessarily have set ages. So we'll have kind of early adulthood, middle adulthood, late adulthood, but there's some debate here. When are you middle-aged, for example? At what point do you start having a midlife crisis? That's kind of a joke. Not everyone has a midlife crisis, but we have defined years. For example, infancy and toddlerhood, birth to two years. That's a very specific age range. As we get into those different periods of adulthood, it's a little bit harder uh, to have defined categories based on age. So we'll start off with prenatal development. So one thing to note about development is that it starts at conception and it ends at death and you are developing throughout the lifespan. It's not as if you get to a certain age and say, okay, well, I'm done developing now. Development is going to continue. So we'll talk a little bit uh, about prenatal development and then we'll get into physical, cognitive, and social development for each of the other age periods we're going to be talking about. So we'll do infancy, uh, early childhood, middle childhood, adolescence, and emerging adulthood. One thing to note about this emerging adulthood term is that it's a relatively new uh, thought. Uh, emerging adulthood suggests that perhaps there's this time period, they usually say about 18 to 25, where you're not quite an adolescent anymore, and yet you're not quite an adult either. In our culture, oftentimes there's this in-between period where you're somewhat independent, but yet maybe you still are receiving some help from parents, you still have a safety net there to fall back on. Of course, not everyone does, but many people um, don't take on the full responsibilities of adulthood right away. Of course, other cultures would look at this and laugh because uh, in their culture, maybe they don't have emerging adulthood, they don't have a time period of several years when they go to college and they're kind of in between. Um, so this is also something that's culturally specific, uh, how you define development when you're an adult, but more on that coming up. Just an introduction today. So these are some issues that you are definitely going to see. Um, these are going to come up over and over again throughout this class and really throughout most psychology classes that you take. So some of these are probably familiar. Uh, nature versus nurture is likely one you've heard before. If not, this is the debate over is our development primarily biological in nature or is it primarily influenced by our environment? So for example, with nature, you might say, well, I am the person I am today because of my genetics, because of the biological material given to me from my uh, biological mom and dad. And certainly there are a lot of things, physical things, your appearance perhaps, um, health issues that can be nature related, uh, as well as um, nurture, which is going to be impacted by the people that you spend time around, which often are your parents. So one thing that makes the nature-nurture discussion difficult is that people who gave you your nature are not always, but very often the people who also gave you your nurture. And so it's the question of, do I act like my dad because I am biologically his child, or do I act like my dad because um, I grew up around my dad? That kind of question. So nurture would refer to your peers, uh, parenting that you received, uh, the culture that you live in, the media that you were exposed to, uh, schools, neighborhoods, that kind of thing. So this issue is definitely going to come up again. Uh, continuity versus discontinuity, I have a picture on the next slide to kind of show you a little bit of what this looks like, but it's a question of how do we develop? Do we develop gradually or is it more a stop and start kind of thing? So continuity, that theory would suggest that we are always developing. Every day we would develop a little bit more. And so it would be hard um, to point the exact moment where you became an adolescent or the exact moment where you became an adult. You're kind of gradually changing over time versus discontinuity or discontinuous view would say 
that you develop at a certain point, you kind of stay where you are, and then when you're ready to jump up to that next stage, and then it's a, a drastic change, an obvious change, like you woke up the next morning and something was different about you. I am going to come back to this slide, but I have a picture here to show you. So continuous development is a gradual slope. This is the theory that you change so subtly that it's hard to tell exactly at what point you have gone from, from one stage to the next. Discontinuous says you stay the same, stay the same, stay the same, and then when it's time, when you're ready, you'll jump up to that next level and you have a drastic change. And then you'll stay the same, stay the same, stay the same, and then another drastic change. So it's more of a stair-step way of thinking about uh, development. So then also there's this universal versus context-specific development. So this is a debate which is related to nature-nurture in a sense, um, but it's the idea, does development happen the same way for everyone? Is development a universal process? And certainly there are certain aspects of development that do look universal. We go through those same stages like I was talking about, rolling over, crawling, uh, walking, running. So certainly there are emotions too. Um, very young children usually can express sadness and happiness and then they are able to express anger and disgust and then later on in life more complex emotions, things like embarrassment and pride. So certainly there are uh, aspects of development that do seem to go in a particular order for just about everyone. However, that way of thinking doesn't take into account the context that you grew up in, the environment, the culture. So uh, there may be certain things about development that are uh, emphasized in certain cultures uh, or not emphasized in other cultures. So it's a question of someone who's growing up halfway across the world uh, versus you. Did you have the exact same development? Did you go through the same processes? Or was the culture that the person was involved in influential in the way that they developed? And of course, with these, um, when it talks about verses, nature versus nurture, or continuous versus discontinuous, there's some truth to both. And as we talk about different theorists in the next lecture video, some theorists would focus on one aspect more than the other. So, when we're talking about human development, we know that we have a biopsychosocial framework here. You may have heard this term before. Basically, what we're saying is that your development is impacted by biological forces psychological forces and sociocultural forces. Now, the way that I think about this is that biology is nature pretty much exclusively. So we're talking about the genetic material that you received and then health related issues that are very often impacted or caused by your genetics. Sociocultural is pretty much exclusively nurture. This is the people you spend time around. So um, different ethnicities, different cultures, um, different parts of society that you grew up in, as well as your relationships with family members and friends. So if biological is pretty much exclusively nature and sociocultural is pretty much exclusively nurture, then we have psychological factors in the middle here. And they certainly are a combination of nature and nurture. So people ask the question, where do psychological disorders come from? Some of them seem to be more genetic. So things like bipolar disorder, uh, schizophrenia, run in families very strongly. But then there are certain disorders um, that are more based on the environment that you're in. So you think about PTSD is something that can't happen unless there is a traumatic event. So your uh, psychological development is impacted both by your genetics and the people that you spend time around. So here it talks about uh, cognition. So we talked about the, the way that you think will come up quite a bit. Uh, emotional experiences that you have, different things that influence your personality. So to try to understand development, we need to consider the biological context, psychological context, and sociocultural context for each person that we're thinking about when we're studying development. Now this is the last thing that I'm going to cover for today, and this is going to kind of set us up to go into our lecture video for next week. The first set of slides here focuses on developmental theories, so that throughout the class we can be referring back to um, different theorists. For example, we talk about Piaget, we talk about Erickson. Uh, when we discuss their theories, then when we come back to a certain age point later, like when we talk about early childhood, middle childhood, will say, well now remember, this is what Erickson said was going on during this time period. This is what Piaget said was going on during this time period. So we're going to be coming back to these theories quite a bit, but I can't have you study theories without telling you what a theory is. 
So one potential definition for a theory, an organized set of ideas that is designed to explain development. This is a, a developmental theory. So a theory is a big picture idea. And just because something is a theory doesn't make it true or not true. Uh, it means it's an idea that we have some evidence for and we continue to test. So you can't test a theory in one particular research study. It's too big. Uh, however, what we do is we take our theory, our general idea, and from that we develop hypotheses. So it talks about this is essential for developing predictions. A hypothesis is, you might have heard, an educated guess. It is uh, a very specific, testable piece of a theory. So if my theory is that children uh, are impacted by watching television, if they're more aggressive after watching certain television shows, then I might have a hypothesis or a prediction that if I take some children and expose them to Sesame Street and other children and expose them to, I don't know, whatever violent shows you kids are watching these days, then I measure their levels of aggression afterwards. Uh, my hypothesis would be that the children who are exposed to the aggressive media would be more aggressive themselves. That's a prediction that is consistent with my theory. It's testable. I can actually go out and do it. So the theory is the idea that drives the research, and then we test bits and pieces of that theory over time to either provide support for it or to realize maybe there's an aspect of our theory that we need to tweak a little bit. So as we see here, predictions result in research that then helps us to support or clarify the theory. The theory may not be true, but we wouldn't know unless we went out and actually tested it. So we're going to be talking about theories of Freud and Erickson and Piaget and others here. These are just theories. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're completely proven true, but they're ideas that guided research. And as we have done research on these topics, we have been refining our understanding of development. So that's where I'm going to end things for this lecture video. As I said, during our next lecture video, we will dive more into uh, developmental theories. Now you do not have an activity for this week so you just need to watch this video which if you're at this point congratulations you've done that and then email me if you have any questions or concerns you want to introduce yourself then that would be great and then during next week's lecture video we will have our first activity. So let me know if you need anything otherwise have a great week.